So I think that's done that for me. And I mean, I've talked about this with a lot of other teachers and a lot of other situations at my own school. And, and just I hope, I hope that this can just become something that we start to see as the reality of public education is that we are just missing the ball because we've been thinking we've been teaching subjects and we've been teaching we've been teaching people. So yeah. Why not? Yeah. Right. The way that the two characters were kind of coming together and uh, you know with a kind of a deep yearning one even one even felt in terms of what each one's experience is. Um, doesn't quite get it. That's, that's, that's a hard experience. It hurt me, brought me back some years. <laughs> I, I, I felt some of those types of feelings many, many years ago. Uh, How did you guys find your way into that? Right? I mean, there is a, a difficulty in which you are so close, when those characters are so close to experiencing a very similar context, and yet there's a, a disparity there in terms of understanding one another, right? So, you know, how did Lamar feel in that way? I mean, he, he's, he has this woman, this, this woman who's opened his heart, or her heart to him, and uh, in that particular moment, uh, that doesn't seem to be enough. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in that situation, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's all active. That's a, that's I mean, you know, I mean, well, first, it's easy to add to read because yeah. like, we've done Amos and Haven together, and I was like, we got really close during that time. And, um, so it was, I can ask for a better acting part, honestly, like, um, so she made it easy, you know, to kind of like work with and play off of, and we would have conversations kind of like starting about, like, where our characters, like, how we met, or, and, like, you know, who, went, who came to the school first and who, you know, so like all that background kind of helped us a lot. But in that moment, I really feel like Amari loves like Jasmine, but I mean, he's really going through this thing like only he really knows kind of what, like how to deal with that. And she's trying to help him, you know, she really, you know, and like, you know, her heart's in it, but it's really something like when you go through a situation like that, it's definitely a personal thing because every person has a way to react to like uh, yeah. to deal with a situation like that. So for Mari, he loved Jasmine, but he's just like, you know, I gotta go because I, like this is something that I have to do. You can't help me even if you want to, you know, yeah. type of deal. Yeah. So I feel like that was kind of where Mari stood. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, that scene is. I mean, it's obviously like very passionate, and there's a lot of like teenage, you know, just like mm -hmm. drama in it. Um, but I think that it points at something that's very real and relevant and that um, there are things that black men go through um, and black boys are experiencing, you know, and being categorized as black men a lot sooner than they ought to be. Um, and so they have issues and struggles and conflicts that even, you know, their counterparts as like a black woman um, just can't get. And so, you know, in this scene, Jasmine is trying really hard. She's trying to... In, in, the, in a lot of ways, she's very selfish. You know, she just wants him to stay with her, and yeah. that's where that teenage rationale kind of comes in. Um, but there's another part that, you know, the issues that black men and black women have, while they're very similar, they're also very dissimilar. Um, and so I think that she just can't really understand why are you running away? It's, it's not that big of a deal. And to him, he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I have to, this is my only solution, and it's like a dire need. Um, so I think that I really like that, um, that that scene kind of touched on that for me. Um, the character for Jasmine was uh, intended to be played by either a Latina or a black actress. And, um, and yeah, I, just, I think that the dynamic between the two of them as being like kids of color who are in this environment in which they are the only kids of color and somehow they found each other, you know, and they kind of made their own little beautiful like little bubble. Um, and so Jasmine just feels very threatened. She doesn't want to be alone. You know, she doesn't want to be go back back to being the only kid of color at this school. And so in a lot of ways, he's her safety net. Um, so it's more than just companionship. It's safety. Um, it's belonging. It's, it's feeling known. Um, so I think that it touches on a lot. It gives a reflection um, to a lot of the issues that we're seeing now with just the plight of black men and how they're seen in society and what. And the, the type of desperation that that builds and, and trying to defend and protect you know, yeah. yourself. I mean, it's a character you're beautifully portrayed, right? So Jasmine, yeah. <coughs> with her, there's subtlety there, right? Because we have a very keen lens on Omari in terms of 
the way Shad is carried. I mean, Naya speaks about that. You know, Naya speaks about the responsibility that everyone has for inculcating that rage in this particular young man. But Jasmine's character really brought that out as well. Right? I mean, she brought that out especially is a whole context of rage that she feels, and context of this context of resentment that she feels relative to this experience that she feels that she's been placed in, similar to how Leo experienced, or you know, kind of portrays that with the woman's character. So, how overt do you think that is? Where is that range? How does that? How did you go on that? Um, I think uh, honestly that I wanted to. I know that it can uh, be seen in its range, but I think that one of the things that I really hoped to bring forth with Jasmine was um, the fact that she she's aggressive and she's assertive. Um, but I don't think there was necessarily rage. I think that she's one of the, the characters in the story that um, the words that she says are almost kind of like a narration of, mm -hmm. of everything else that's kind of going on. She kind of says the things that none of the other characters are saying, but that the audience really needs to hear. Conscience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. so kind of like a stream of consciousness yeah. that's going on. Um, but I think that one of the things that I was really excited about with Jasmine is that um, in a lot of theater, uh, we aren't used to see an ingenue character that looks like Jasmine, that sounds like Jasmine, that talks hard, and she's aggressive, and she uses African-American vernacular English, and she's still innocent, and she still has a lot of, you know, she's still very naive. Um, and I really wanted people to be able to see a girl who could be very threatening in a lot of contexts. I mean, she uses her words very hard and very forthrightly. Um, and oftentimes that portrayal of a black girl or a brown girl is thought of as like too much or it's threatening or, it, or she, she has a lot of rage in her. Um, but I think Jasmine presents a, a different um, picture where she is, you know, she's forthright, she knows what she wants, she says what she wants, she's filled with drama because she's a teenager and yet she's still compassionate and kind and loving, you know, and she's all of those things. So. Um, I think for me it was less about bringing out her rage and more about bringing um, some of the things that people see as negative aspects in black culture um, and bringing them out into the forefront and then give the forefront and then giving people the opportunity to decide is this actually a negative thing or, or am I seeing this as a negative thing because I'm not used to it. Yeah. So. It's, it's what you said, what the line says. You can't hold. You right. can't hold us. Yeah, yeah. And I, that was that's so telling to me. Mm -hmm. Can't hold you. Can't hold us. Right, right. More space. Mm -hmm. So Jasmine's character definitely gave me the feels. Right? Anybody else? Like I felt that was a very relatable character. Yeah. For <laughs> 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 Can I just say yeah, a word about that? I, I'm. I really love the fact that I could have Tariq in this role because I knew that she would bring some intelligence, some real deep intelligence to what it's like to be. Um, a young woman who is intelligent and who is standing up for herself and whatnot. And I, the thing that I really got more than anything else was we saw a character in Jasmine who nobody would blink an eye if it was male. I mean, mm -hmm. they were saying those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Okay? No one would blink an eye if it was the protagonist savior who saves the day. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they can say whatever they want. They can be as hard as they want to. Why couldn't a woman? Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated that she took that on as making it, not making it a caricature. I don't think that Jasmine was a caricature in any way. But at the same time, she's just, she's just brilliantly herself. And I love that. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Central kind of lightning rod for everyone is, uh, mind you, that person was very put in a situation like that a year ago. So, for the full point of like, <laughs> cast rage or anything else, would be that character. But, uh, how did it feel to sit there? I mean, in terms of like, my memory is really bringing out some of the most powerful expression in the story relative to visualizing all of this. And, Putting the tree out into, into open space and that very cutting context of being a whole CD. I mean, that's something that, that was a hard moment to kind of sit through, it was a hard moment to, to receive, to be open to, and your character does that really well. How did, uh, how did you feel about that? Or what was uh, that kind of. And, and very 
So he hit deep simply because I tagged him in through the same situation, which is actually a little bit personal for me. I cut my father off about six years ago. I haven't spoken to him. I haven't done that. That's just a choice I made because of all the experiences I went through growing up with him. Um, even when I hit high school, having to deal with him, and I realized at a very young age, especially after college, that he was just a liability in my life. So I just ceased that. And uh, so once I got, you know, and put it into this world, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> literally, um, I started thinking about having my own rest. It's important to have like, you know, open communications with your kids and all that. And now, you know, placing this role on, okay, so now I have to be, you know, Xavier, who, once again, he didn't break the family. You know, his wife, you know, she committed infidelity and all the next thing you know, he has to bear the, you know, background and everything and try to be like, hey, look, we can't be together, but yeah, I understand you're my son. And I feel as a man, look, I go to work, I provide for you. Um, I'm doing all this, you know, you don't, I, I, I still go to your school events, birthday parties, do all this, but for some reason you're still not acknowledging me as an important figure in your life. And I feel like I'm doing everything, you know, right and all. But once again, you're, you're, you're counting everything I'm doing the same and all. And at that point in time, it's just, it, there's a lot of emotions involved because just like I said earlier, I went through it personally, and then I'm acting on it too, on behalf of you know playing the role of Xavier. But um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Though it's brief that we're all kind of, I mean, this this show story encapsulates literally like two days of real action, and then a passage of time in the last scene. But even in this microcosm of this moment that happened we're all I think very symbolic of what each one of us has and that's what I think is so great about the show is that everyone can find themselves in someone in the show and it's not because of the genetic makeup of oh you know I can, like, it's the burden of teenagehood it's the burden of stereotypes it's the burden of overwork it's frustration it's a parent it's a girlfriend it's a spouse it's whomever it's all of that and so we had a discussion at one point about which line we think each of our characters which one of our characters lines encapsulates our story of the show and at first I thought it was we didn't carve out enough space and I think that's something that everybody struggles with we can talk about issues of privilege and bias and those kinds of things and how they play into the space. But now I think it's, we built the jungle. Oof. There's a jungle out there, yeah. in here, in here. Oh, yeah. And so I think when you see us navigate all of our jungles, it doesn't show what happens necessarily. Do they come out of the jungle? Because I think we're just always going in the jungles if we're coming out of them. But I think that that is something that I hope people will take away is that I'm in the jungle, they're in the jungle too, and like Brad mentioned, we got to see each other as a jungle and see that we did it. And then if I see somebody in the jungle and I don't maybe understand why they're struggling in it, let me help them go get them out of it. You got to see each other. You two got to see each other. See, yeah. that's a brave sense. And you pull out this or there. How does it feel? We won't. We won't. And as a as the playwright has put forth, and as Bradley has mentioned as well too, it's, the, it's not about answer, um, providing answers, it's, it's about opening up for conversation mm -hmm. for it to continue. And that is um, a part of the bigger picture of this project, is that we do continue this conversation. Um, I was inspired to pull together this project, um, well not only by the plays that were submitted, because they, you know, especially when Bradley Brown uh, proposed this to me, I was like, oh yes, we're absolutely going to do it. You know, it was very powerful and very uh, timely. Um, and then back in November uh, last year, I decided to, I, I went on a trip with the um, uh, United Church of Gainesville's uh, Racial Justice Task Force. Montgomery. Yeah, to Montgomery, exactly. And the NAACP was a part of that as well, too. And that really inspired me to um, really want to make sure that we continue this conversation to get the word out. Um, because even here on a local level,
there is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk right now about uh, truth and reconciliation. And, um, you know, whether we had gotten the grant or not, I still wanted to make this happen. And I'm very delighted we did get the grant. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, either way, like I said, we were going to make it happen either way. And um, it's because there, there is this uh, larger conversation around truth and reconciliation um, at the government level, which is what we need in our community. Um, hopefully, you know, it will expand. And I want to say trickle down, but definitely it's just expand. We don't want the ripple effect. And so I like to think of this project as a continuation of what our local government is doing on the county level. Hutch, Hutch, is, you know, uh, Hutchison is, 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 is a really big proponent right now. He's really rallying around the whole truth and reconciliation um, on the government level. And so, um, and I like to think of this project, as I mentioned earlier, as being a continuation of that conversation. And then what, what we do in this creative space, um, I'm hoping and praying that you, as well, will go out and continue the conversation, just to be inspired. The same way that I was inspired to create this for conversation, I'm hoping that each and every one of us here in the space will be inspired to see how they can continue the conversation, whether it be something in writing, you know, whether it be, you know, in, in, in politics, you know, make, who knows, running for office of sort, um, you know, making changes in, 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 your, in your educational environment, you know, being a proponent in that regard. You know, I want all of us to continue the conversation in whatever way we can best do it with the, with the uh, skill sets and the capabilities that we have. Beautiful. And that's what strikes me as maybe the, the at least down payment on moving forward on that. And so I was, I just am also proud to have this small town of people like you. I taught in Rochester County Schools for 20 years, and it reminded me a lot of classroom students and about the absurdity of asking the teacher to teach five or six classes and have 180 students at some point. And, you know, it, if we don't get education right now, it's going to change. And, you know, no one can do right by. 150, 180 kids every single day. Oh my gosh. It did. The horror. Yeah. And, uh, and I found myself sitting there thinking, my gosh, this is what um, the, uh, the week back the teachers were happy to include experiences like this right. mm -hmm. to get them kind of focused on what the real world is. Right. Mm -hmm. It's about, I mean, obviously, it plays about more than education. The setting is the school, but it's about parents and problems with that, the raising of children, you know, what am I responsible for, um, and then just the whole system that is the container that we, we find ourselves in. Um, the play does an excellent the author, I mean, the, the author has done an awesome job, I think, of pulling together these different strands, oh, yeah. and then just in the lives of a few people, able to help me identify with my role as as parent what I didn't do or should have done or could have would have should have uh, my role as an educator you know what what passed by because I wasn't paying enough attention to uh, individual needs and it just you know it's a very good experience and I you can bet on that better be the editor <laughs> so Carrie Bradley Hicks, our director and the artistic director of this beautiful house we are in right now. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks.